This episode is sponsored by Tegas. Understanding expert insights is table stakes for investors today, and there's no better option than Tegas. I've been using them for years to get up to speed on companies, and they've helped me immensely as an investor. Tegas also recently acquired both BAM SEC and Canalyst, adding a super fast way to access SEC filings and earning calls via BAM SEC and offering access to more than 4,000 fully drivable financial models with Canalyst. Tegas is well on their way to building a full suite of research products that can displace the le legacy terminal providers like CapIQ and FactSet. And I'd encourage you to check them out if you haven't recently. They are moving incredibly quickly with many new features and data sets. As a bonus note, Blog readers will know that I run a monthly, uh, well, actually bi-monthly deep dive series sponsored by Tegas. In them, I go deep into industries and companies with fascinating questions using Tegas expert calls. I'd encourage you to check that out if you're interested in seeing how expert interviews can help you learn more about a company and industry. Hello, and welcome to the Yet Another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. And if you like this podcast, it would mean a lot if you could follow, rate, subscribe, review it wherever you're watching or listening to it. With me today, I'm happy to have Judd Arnold. Judd, uh, Judd, I don't know what to, I don't know what title to call you. I guess private investor. Judd has done uh, just phenomenal work on the stock we're going to talk about. But Judd, you can call yourself whatever you like. But hey, how's it going? Thanks for coming on. No, oh, thanks for having me. This is great. Well, let me start this podcast off with a quick disclaimer. First, I just want to remind everyone that nothing on this podcast is investing advice. You know, we're going to be talking about, I think, the offshore space in general with a particular focus on Tidewater today. Uh, every company that we've talked about has gone bankrupt at least once, maybe twice in the past five <laughs> years. So if that's not a screamer saying, hey, please do your own work, you know, not financial advice, consult a financial advisor. I don't know what is. But anyway, you posted a fantastic uh, memo. I was very jealous of it because I've been following the space for a while, but you posted a fantastic memo, mainly focused on Tidewater, but covering the offshore space in general last month. I'll include a link to it. You did this great spaces on Twitter, on the offshore space. I'll include a link to that in the show notes as well for anyone who wants to check that out. But you did it. I reached out and said, hey, I've been doing work. I wanted to have you on. So uh, yeah, just wanted to have you on. Talk about Tidewater in the offshore space in general. So I'll kind of pause my rambling there and just tell us, you know, just high level, what's so interesting about Tidewater and the offshore space in general to you right now? It's the inverse of 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. That's what's interesting about it. And, you know, that was that short trade was one of the best trades I've ever had while working for somebody else. I, I worked at three mega hedge funds uh, in my career and, you know, that that was just an awesome trade setup. So energy is my original sector. I started in, in banking at Lehman Brothers at Power and Utilities way back in the day. Then I went to my first hedge fund where I was the energy guy. I was the energy guy at the second one, too, uh, with some other stuff, too. So it, it is I, I thought energy as a sector was dead for seven, eight years. And I just coming back to it over the last year. The setup here is just so fascinating. And ultimately, I mean, the, the simple word is just convex. Energy investing is all about convexity. It's unlike growth because you can get all the analysis right. And if you get the commodity wrong, you're just going to get slaughtered. So um, you need to create really interesting risk rewards. And I think with offshore specifically, I get this question all the time, like why offshore, you know, OSVs, which are offshore vehicles, which is a fancy word for a boat. Um, it's, you know, a 30 to, well, now they say new builds, like a 60, $70 million operation for an OSV. Drilling rigs, deep water rigs are now, you know, billion dollar assets. You think about though that asset quality versus, a frack spread, which, you know, is effectively a diesel truck, although now they got electric, whatever, you know, a 10, $15 million asset that's going to get run to the ground in five years, big replacement cycle, and anybody can run a frack spread. It, it just doesn't matter. Offshore, it, it's like, it, these are big assets. Like they take three to five years to build. You have to have the right people running them. Now, granted, it's a capital intensive industry, which is why the big boy, the big EMP companies don't do this and effectively outsource it to, you know, on the rig side to the big rig operators, be it Valeris, which is, you know, I'll always call Lensco, you know, Transocean, Noble, Diamond Offshore, Sea Drill. And then on the OSV side, you've got a bunch of people. Most of the companies are actually private. You got a bunch of Norwegian entities, but, you know, 
that's another super interesting one as well. And they sort of work very well in tandem. For every rig, roughly, you need four OSVs. Perfect. So there's a couple things I, I wanted to dive in there. First, you dated yourself because you said you worked at Lehman and you worked at a hedge fund as the energy guy. So now people know, A, you worked at Lehman there and B, you worked at a hedge fund when all of them still had energy, when they still had energy people, because not many hedge funds have those yeah. anymore, though. We might get that. But let's just talk. So 12 to 14, right? You said this is the inverse of 2012 to 2014. And for people listening, I just did a companion podcast. I'm going to release on side this with uh, Tidewater's management that you can go listen to that talks about. But can you talk about like, you know, you say 12 to 14, this is the inverse. What was 12 to 14 like and why is this the inverse? 12 to 14, you just, I mean, it, it didn't blow up until 14 when OPEC, you know, effectively stopped defending price. And you think about offshore versus onshore. Offshore is long cycle. You're, if you and me own an EMP company, we're drilling off Guyana or wherever. We're making a five, six, seven year bet on prices. And at that board meeting, we're, you know, the board deck is this is a five to ten billion dollar commitment. Yep. And once this thing's built, like it's gonna flow huge fixed costs, very, very low variable, and, and so forth. You think about shale, it's the inverse of that, which is you know, the wells used to be 10, 10 million bucks a pop. Now they're seven to eight, although they're probably going back to 10 with, with onshore cost inflation. But you get back all your capital within, I don't know, two months. And then you've got this really big tail and, you know, huge decline rate, what, what have you. And what you saw in 14, once, you know, OPEC stopped defending and shale became ascendant, is every board made the rational decision of, heck, I don't know where pricing is going but there is no way I'm making a multi-year bet. I'm just not. And this was when offshore had sort of crescendo. So you, you right before the, OP, the OPEC bust and, and shale, I mean, you had a new build order book that was 30% of the existing fleet. And so it wasn't just that existing assets got BK'd. Like <laughs> you were just dead. Like it was over. Like it, it was going to take you know, or what I thought was more than a decade to sort itself out. And what turns out was, you know, a lot of these guys came out of bankruptcy in 17, 18, 19, and they, it was still crap. You looked at the supply and demand, you're like, this math makes no sense. And COVID really was the accelerant that just destroyed the last vestiges of hope. And you really rationalized all these fleets. And then right as COVID, you know, sort of rolled through, you're like, wow, Shale's kind of peeking out. OPEC's now defending price. OPEC's kind of back. And if you, you know, I graduated college in 04. So about half my career was pre-shale. You know, it was 100 bucks a barrel. It was just normal. Natural gas was seven. Uh, the TXU LBO, which I'm, I guess I'm really dating myself. We, we sat there and we're like, okay, Buffett's buying 675 nat gas. It's actually yep. not a bad trade. <laughs> like, <laughs> Everything you're saying, the TXG one is so funny because Buffett, I mean, he took a bath. Everyone took a bath on it. That was the most complex one. And last year, people were going crazy about, I'm only talking domestic. Obviously, $100 nat gas in Europe is different. But people were going crazy because nat gas was touching 8 or $9 for a month or two here domestic. And it's like, hey, you know, 10 years ago, that, that was like, that was kind of the baseline pricing here. And obviously, shills changed that nat gas. But yeah, so I, I guess the way to think about it is, 12 to 14, you have this bo huge boom. Tons of boats get ordered. I mean, as you said, about 30% of the global supply. And I know all the, I, I even was teasing Tidewater about it. You can go back to Tidewater deck in 2013 and they were saying, oh, don't worry about all these new builds. It's only 15 or 20% of the global uh, global yeah. vehicles and we're going to have retirement. So it'll only account for the retirements. Fast forward 10 years and like what you're having now is the kind of the evolution of what you had there where, hey, for 10 years, not a single boat has been built. So you've got all these retirements and all these boats have come online. You've got uh, every, I, I do want to talk about the the supply dynamic, but you know you haven't had boats. You have no new build boats. As you said, it would take two and a half years. You're starting to see drilling happening again. So demand is going up and that supply response can't really come up online because all the excess supply from years ago is getting taken out and there's no new builds coming on. I mean, think about this for a second. Tidewater is right now trading, a, you call it 1617 EV. All right. They've got just under 200 boats. 
if they, you know, new build is somewhere between 60, 70 million bucks. Let's, let's just say it's 60. And let's forget about how long it's going to take. Okay. So 30 boats is the enterprise value of the company, new build. And they've got, you know, 200 that are roughly 10 years old. I, I, I get that. But in terms of, you know, my old world, you know, back in 12, 13, you were always worried about these guys building and building and building. And it was just a constant thing with this fleet refresh garbage that the street supposedly wanted. And I, I don't think they ever did. And now you talk to these guys, not only are they not to order, they can't order. Like, it's not credible for you to, all the yards went bankrupt. All the South Korean guys did. Most of the Chinese yards went bankrupt. That's the other thing. Once that assembly line stops, yep, nobody really knows what it, what it costs to build a rig or an OSV because we're not building them. And if you don't build them, think about like, you know, the F-35 program. If you build, like, what does a prototype F-35 cost versus, you know, a batch of 200? If you don't build them, a lot of them at one time, you have no economy of scale. So you you layer that plus just like the dollar amount versus the EBs of these, these companies. So for Tidewater, like I said, like, is it really credible that they're going to show up to a yard and be like, yeah, we want 30 OSVs and the, the yard's going to be like, okay, we went bankrupt because of you people. I'm going to want a 60% deposit. Well, they're not going to get a 60%. I mean, they're not going to get 40. So even if they wanted to, I mean, with the deep water rig guys, it's even crazier. Valeris is, depending on how you want to value ARL, call it a $4.5 billion EV. Yep. I think they've got 38 or 39 uh, deep water rigs and a bunch of jackups, whatever. Like literally the market value, the entire enterprise value of the company would be dwarfed by a five rig order, which wouldn't, like, it wouldn't move the needle. And obviously they're, they can't order five. You're not, it's not credible. So think about like the daisy chain that's going to happen. So BP or whoever is going to go to a rig guy. Okay. I want the newest, whatever. And they're going to go to the yard, whoever it is. And the yard is going to tell them to go pound sand unless you get a parent guarantee. So then the rig guy or the OSB guy is going to go back to like the BP or whoever and say, they're telling me I need a guarantee and you're going to have to give it. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Let me just back up a second. So I think for people who haven't followed followed this industry, it, one thing that yeah. might be helpful is, again, in 2012 to 2014, and we've seen this cycle play out before, yeah. right? All the, the OSV guys, all the offshore guys don't know it, but they're all about to go bankrupt because you're about to have this glut of oversupply. You've got all these- 100%. Getting- fi- it's like 90% fixed costs on the income statement. Yep. So day rates go up, day ra- you, you get it all, day rates go down, you get slaughtered. And what happened was- these guys lost on on two metrics, right? Utilization went from you can't really run an OSV more than ninety percent of the time yep. because there's dry docks and the uh, cruise changes and all the other stuff. Same thing for a deep water rig, but utilization, I think, round numbers for the industry went from like you know low eighties to fifty. Yep, and day rates went from you know for the for really good stuff went from like twenty eight thousand to twelve. No, actually ten. I'm sorry. And so you just got slaughtered on everything, and then you dumped a bunch of new new boats into it. And none of these cap, you know, they financed all the new build, obviously with a ton of debt. All these guys had a ton of debt, and it, it just was like game set match, goodbye. But I just on the new build, I just want to drill it down. What's different now versus eight years ago? Or yeah, so, right? so now because- you can't build. And like I, I touch all these points and they're huge because what am I really saying? Like the in every offshore investor's mind is this management team is going to screw me. Yep. Yep. And so what you have now in terms of belts and suspenders and probably I, I don't know what there's a third thing beyond belts and suspenders, but you ha- you have it right now. The yards don't want to build. So the time to build plus they just don't want to the cost plus the deposits. It used to be 10% down and the, and the yard would finance you. Now it's like 40, 50, you know, it's going to be five years. Forget about it. You, you Like the yards just don't want this stuff. They're building other stuff, you know, LNG carriers, regular shipping vessels. Like they don't want this stuff. So even if you have a management team go rogue or more likely you have the EMP producer go to the rig company or the OSB company and say, I want the new one. You're yep, going to yep. get it for me or else like you just can't like, like there, there's so many points on that chain 
where it just won't happen. And so it's not that we're not going to have new build this cycle. Of course, we're going to have it. You at least have a two to three year period where the amount of new build that you're going to have ordered is negligible. Yep. And then once they order, you're going to have another two to five years before it even hits hits the water. So you've got this period right now where rates have already inflected. Okay. So for Tidewater, their average day rate, I think it's up to uh, 13.5 now. They peaked at 18,000. Now the fleet composition is way better now. Yep. Yep. But, you know, they're going to be 15. Leading edge is probably, you know, 16, 17 right now across all their vessels with their best ones are already, I mean, they just got a contract for 40,000 a day. Yep. Like, <laughs> um, and like, if we talk about this in deep water rigs, I, I like doing that because the assets are more uniform and like as deep water rigs go and that and, way it's just, it, and it's a good time because rig just priced a bunch of contracts last night. So we've got like literally right. 24 hours of up-to-date pricing. So deep water, it's super easy. OPEX is 200 a day round number. Okay. We bottomed at day rates at 200 a day. So operators were like, I make nothing, but I keep the crew, which is really important. That's what people never didn't understand on the way down, which is these guys aren't going to stack all the vessels and basically take them off the water because they do that. They lose all the expertise of the, of the crew. Yep. So you have to keep operating and it's crazy. And this, the same thing happens in trucking by the, and there's a few other industries like this where you just, you have to operate for zero profit. So you're at a zero profit. You're, we're now back to 400 a day, which is huge. And, you know, call it low 400s. We peaked the last cycle called six, six and change. New build economics, depending on how you want to, you know, debate what discount rate, somewhere 475, 500. And think about drilling is roughly a third of the cost of a well. Offshore, it's really hard to get the unit economics. Yep. It's like... Uh, you know, that's like the holy grail of, you know, the offshore Excel nerd trying to like do, do, do the unit economics. Uh, like uh, the easier thing is just to understand the day rate trend because it's like this massive game theory thing. And if you know one, you know the other. And these things are massively in the money. So we're already seeing like a year ago, you had to make all the speculative calls where you're like, oh, this looks really good. Like this is, you know, and then in the back of my mind, too. Again, versus shale. This is long cycle. This is offshore is a snowball going down the hill. Once it gets moving, it's like it's like turning an aircraft carrier where you at where shale is like turning a fighter jet. Like they they can turn it on, they can turn it off. Offshore, once you commit, you're committed. And we're seeing that pick up. And so 400 a day. It's going to be 450 a day. It's going to be 500 because we're through rigs. And the, the way you see that both with rigs and OSVs is utilization of these fleets. Once you get to 80, like day rates just start reflecting. It it gets really tense, right? From 60 to 65% utilization, who cares? There's still tons of boats. But once you start getting at 75, 80%, all of a sudden the operators start looking around and say, oh, we can't bid them at OPEX costs anymore because things are tight. And as it goes 80, like, again, as you said, a, a rig, which a rig is much more expensive than OSV for people, uh, Tidewater's OSV, rig, Val, those are all the rigs. They're much more expensive, but they're still a third of the well cost. So if you go from 400000 a day to 420000 a day, it's not that much in the grand scheme of, uh, of a offshore well that's going to produce thousands and thousands of barrels of oil a day at Seventy dollars per barrel. It's not that much, so you can go from four hundred to five hundred thousand real quick. I, do, you, do you want to throw anything? Yeah, on that? and I, I think the other piece of this too is what we're drilling. What we're drilling right now is this is the best stuff. Greenfield they, offshore? No, brown, it's brownfield. Like, yeah, sorry, sorry, brownfield. Yep. Yeah. Like we shut off offshore. They for the next three years, they know where all the oil is. It's on the. It's been on the shelf. So shale, we're like, we're doing parent child. We're like, okay, we're going back to the Utica. All right. You know, we're really going bottom of the barrel. It's like, it's it's crazy stuff. It's if like, if you're like a foodie in Manhattan, they just shut off like the West Village for 10 years. And then they just turn it back on. Like everyone knows what restaurants they want to go to. And then they're really good. They're really good. So I like... I, I take all of that and I'm like, okay, 
what's your day? And, and they've all do like Tybar's got no debt. I mean, like, and you've got a restrictive bond. Val's got a restrictive bond. So Tidewater management, if they want to screw you, they really can. It's a lockbox until the end of 2020. Uh, well, now we're in 2023. I used to say, all right, November, 2023, they're going to refi this bond. So they really can't do anything crazy again on like, I, so, and then I, I think they're going to pay out cash flow anyway, because like you're a management team, you've lasted this long. I think everybody's going to be a little bit like Valerius, where they're going to be a little bit conservative because they're like, I almost lost my job in my career. And if you're, <laughs> you're, you're like a 50, 60 year old offshore oil executive, like, you know, this is it, man. <laughs> like <laughs> Famous, some of the some of the many famous last words in investing is uh, trusting, trusting oil and gas management teams. But I'd encourage anyone go listen to the Tidewater podcast. I just did Bob Rabati's on the board. And I think Tidewater's clear. I think Bob is a, you know, he, he knows his stuff. I think th- he's going to communicate to the board. Or he'll at least be one voice. You're, we're not going on a crazy spending spree here, right? We're going to have this huge inflow of cash and we're going to do a creative stuff. Maybe it's doing things like the SPO deal, which I think was a very nice deal, but it's probably going to involve a lot of capital return at some point. I think it's all going to be capital return. And I, I mean, I think the big thing to remember too is, you know, Tidewater 10 year average fleet, these boats can stay on the water for another 30 years. The yep. dry dock gets a little bit more expensive and you lose a little efficiency, but you know, most of my math. So like the fair multiple, because like the, the if you do a single ship DCF and I have it in the um, in the memo I put out, like with a 15% cost of capital, basically you should back into with paying a seven times multiple year one on that asset. And by year 10, it's like worth a five times multiple on whatever your day rate assumption is. But if I you give me another 10 years, which is what we're saying, okay, then it's a seven times multiple is fair. And maybe we'll, we'll discount that a little bit for a 10 year average fleet because you know, those last 10 years, we're going to, you know, more, the dry docking is going to be like, okay, like this piece of the hole corroded. We need to like put up steel wall board to like keep the water out. You're going to lose some hydrodynamic efficiency on it, but whatever, like, you know, this thing, <laughs> here's the joke, like Tidewater could do a billion of free cash flow at new build economics. Let, let me... Go ahead. Go ahead. Did you want to say something? Yeah, on a 1.5 billion EV, and we could we could reach new build economics, likely go through it within the next 18 to 24 months. I mean, that's kind of the whole story right now. Like, I can talk. I think we can go into every piece of it, but at a very high level, all you need to remember is new build economics are likely to be hit within you know 18 to 24 months. Maybe if you're mean 36, and that's a billion of free capital. <laughs> That's what actually what I was going to say. Like when I look at Tidewater, and I've got a position in Tidewater, I'll disclose. Mm-hmm. You you put the memo out. I'm sure you've got a position in Tidewater, so we can disclose that. But when I look at Tidewater or a lot of the offshore space in general, right? Like I kind of look at it as, and there is one big caveat: oil prices can't go to forty. But as mm-hmm. long as oil prices don't crap out, you know, you've got this great cycle where it's not that we're betting. As you said, twelve months ago, you were saying things starts are starting to look better, and obviously the stock prices have moved, moved a little bit since then. But like Tidewater, I'm paying eight or eight and a half times last quarter's annualized EBITDA. That is going to go up real fast because we're already seeing the leading edge rates at really attractive rates. But what I love about the thesis is there's no debt. So it's not like I'm taking on huge leverage risk on like, say, like a Transocean or something. There's no debt. So I'm kind of just buying this unlevered. I can wait a little bit if things got rocky for six months or something. But, you know, we're about to see this gusher of a free cash flow if rates can hold 30,000. But the two great things to me are, A, New Build economics are still above the 30,000 rate, right? So you'd need rates to go even higher to even start to incentivize New Build. And then as we've talked about, like, it would take two and a half years minimum if you started today New Building. And I don't even think that's realistic because, A, we're not incentivized, and B, shipyards aren't set up. So you almost have this great thing where you're paying a value-ish multiple on last quarter's earnings. Those are going to go way up. We're already seeing the rates. You're going to have this huge cash flow gusher. And we're having all that without even hitting kind of like super normal profits that would start to incentivize the new build. It's just like all of these great things, like all the stores. And, and you can't really new build right now if you wanted to. Yes. And that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, yep. and that's, that, that's the huge thing. And so we're going to sustain economics way longer. And so we can debate whether it's going to go, like, I think what's really going to happen is this mix of you're going to get some premium rate, but really you're just going to take a lot more term. And which I'm, it, it just doesn't matter. The thing's so so darn cheap. Let's talk about so 
obviously, you know, the offshore space in general well, right? And I think the two areas people can play is you could do the OSVs and that's pretty much only Tidewater. There are some smaller international ones, but Tidewater is pretty much the only play. Or you could go do an offshore driller and your offshore drillers, the ones everybody looks at is it's really Valeris, Noble, or if you want a lot of juice on the upside, because it is really, really levered because it's the one that didn't go bankrupt, Transocean. And you published the memo focused on Tidewater. So I do want to ask, like, obviously, a lot of the dynamics we're talking about apply to all the sector, a little bit different, but why focus on Tidewater versus a Valeris, a Noble, a Transocean, which would give you that massive upside over there? Yeah, I, I touch on this a little bit in the memo. Like, Tidewater, it's 50 million shares. It's not super liquid. So you're going to buy what you can buy. And every investor has a different pain threshold in terms of how much liquidity they want. You can't really trade around it. And I, I tell you know all my clients, I said, pick your number. Like, it's the best one. Because why is it the best one? It's the most open. The rates are going to reset the quickest. And I think there's yep. this debate and it really comes in the most with Valeris, which is the best assets, I would say, but it has the worst contracting position by far. Yep. So it's like the year, the next year multiple on Valeris is like 12, 13 times EBITDA, but on an open basis, it's by far the cheapest on a price to nap. It's super cheap. You're just not going to get to eat that, <laughs> that cash flow um, in, until probably 2025. And then you've got rig, which is the most open, you know, you're going to reprice most of the fleet by in 2023, but you, you, you got a lot of leverage. You like the thing, the thing's super levered. I, I'm, I'm a, you know, distressed debt dude. So uh, at least my first two hedge funds were. So for me, it's like, okay, this thing is blatantly obvious and it's never filing for bankruptcy and they, we're, we're fine. But I, I, I get that people don't, don't want that. So, I, and if I, st- I'm with you, but <laughs> you look at those numbers and the debt and rigs really interesting for people who don't know. They basically the top of last cycle, they signed 10 year contracts with it was Shell, right? I think it was Shell. Yeah. 10 year so- contracts, top of last cycle. Because of that, they were so levered, but those 10 year contracts let them, you know, go through all of this and kind of come out the other side without filing. Everyone else had to file. And Rig is interesting. So because of that, they're super levered. But it's also interesting as a story of, hey, you know, in two years, if this cycle plays out, you could see a lot of people kind of pulling the Transocean, signing some really long contracts at really nice multiples and just returning all that cash to shareholders or something. I think they're just all going to return. I mean, so I, I I think this sector just works in general. And I mean, part of why I put a note out on Tidewater was just the other ones are covered. Tidewater really isn't. And I think Tidewater like could benefit from being highlighted. So, you know, part of what I do now in my career, which is sort of more if I sort of left hedge funds right before COVID and then got roped into a few things. And what I do now through Lake Cornelia is I'm a consultant to a few hedge funds and family offices, mostly mid-sized guys. And basically the pitch is you could hire a guy full time you know, for, you know, I don't want to sound like a hedge fund jerk, but, <laughs> um, you know, that guy costs, if you're a 50, $60 million family office up to a $500 million hedge fund or even a billion dollar hedge fund, you know, a quality guy costs a couple hundo and that that's real money. And most people who run these funds are used to, you know, working with people at a different level. And so I said, look, I'm going to give you my ideas. I'm going to be a basically an outsourced senior analyst to you. You get what I'm looking at, which is there's a lot of energy. I also do a lot of event driven stuff and whatnot. And, you know, all the money's on your, your books, all the, you know, especially the family offices they want to keep. <laughs> Nobody wants to outsource anymore. Everybody wants to do it themselves. And that's sort of this business that sort of has evolved for me um, as I manage my own money as well um, since 2020 and sort of, the thought was I had one of my one of my bigger clients wanted me to you know be more public on Twitter. And then that sort of evolved into putting stuff out. And sort of with Tidewater, I just said, look, I, I didn't put anything out in a, in a while. I just said, look, it, people seem interested. I could highlight something that isn't covered and not in a pumpy way. You know, mm-hmm. Because I don't know how you really pump it, but let me lay out all the all the work. People are already looking at the space. I think this is really interesting. Granted, it's a billion five market cap. Um, and I think people should look at it and just start a conversation and whatnot. And I, you know, I was really stunned with how many people listen to the spaces. I, 
the company was really stunned. I, I think everybody was really stunned. Like over 6,000 people listened. And I, I, I think going forward, I'm going to do a lot more of it, you know, in situations like that. Like it doesn't make, I, I have nothing to add on Apple. <laughs> like, I, you know, no, but. I, that, that's the thesis behind this podcast too, right? I, I mean, I guess sometimes we'll do larger companies, but I, yeah. I will just say like, people should go look this. I said at the beginning, the spaces was awesome. The the note was awesome. It was obviously right in the wheelhouse, but yeah, yeah, that that's the dream. Uh, let me ask a, a few other questions on this. Look, I'm bullish on, I'm bullish on this. You're bullish on this. Again, people can listen to the companion podcast on this. Tidewater management's pretty bullish. A lot of people are going to hear this and you know what I, I tweeted out. Hey, do you have questions for Judd? A lot of people said, why would anyone invest in this space? I think a lot of people were scarred by the past five, seven years in this space. But, you know, the famous thing in commodities, people were calling super cycle for oil in 2014, and that obviously didn't come in. Uh, what breaks the cycle for offshore at this point? Is it only oil prices going to 40, or is there anything else that can kind of stop the rise and send us back to... I, I, I don't think oil going to 40 stops. I think it pauses it. And, and, and my note that I put out, I, I started with the macro, and look, I started as a commodity investor, so you always start with supply and demand. Yep. Depending on where you are in the cycle, the supply demand is either in the front or it's in the back. And I, I have this operating thesis on oil that we die at 105. And what that means is that 105 million barrels a day, I just don't see how the math works. Now, it, it always gets solved, don't get me wrong. But effectively, from 2010 to you know roughly 2019, we went from 85 million barrels a day to 100 million barrels a day. And most of that was, it, it, I want to say, it was China, was, was two-thirds of that demand increase. And the Middle East and a few other emerging areas were the rest of it. So non-developed world. And from a supply perspective, shale was, I, I, I think, 11 and a half or 12 million barrels a day of that 15. And you think about prospectively what we do. And, you know, shale's peaking in the U.S. And so we're back in my mind to this world where offshore, which is 25 million barrels a day, five of which is, all, is true deep water. The rest is continental shelf you know, 20 million barrels a day, you're looking at OPEC spending, I don't know, 30, 40 billion dollars to increase production from 12 to 13 million barrels a day. Really, I mean, they're going to have 50% of the jackups fleets in the, in the world is going to be in the Persian Gulf. You know, OPEC just going nuts. What does that tell you? Like, we're in real trouble. So I, I don't know if the next 10 years we grow per uh, demand by 15 million barrels a day. I don't really need to, like, it's, it's going to grow like China GDP per, you know, what is it? Oil, oil use per capita numbers. I mean, the, the numbers are massive and in India as well, which is incredibly ascendant. I mean, I'm dating myself a little bit, but the, the operating numbers used to be, you know, five, 10 years ago that if China goes to Mexico, um, oil use per capita that increases 18 million barrels a day, which is U.S. demand. And if India goes to China at that point in time, <laughs> not that India isn't going to increase. And those you know, round numbers, India, China, basically same number of people, that increases six and a half million barrels a day. And it's just these numbers are stress are huge. Now you don't have to buy into all of this crazy peak oil, all this other stuff, to know that like on the margin. Offshore spending is going up because that's where the oil is and we need it. And I, I think it's as simple as that. We've seen fleets of rigs and OSVs go down over 12 years. We're starting to see investment pick up. We're still 50% of peak 2014 levels. We're back to 2020. You know, we're, This year, we might be at 2010 levels of offshore spending. That was right before they really ramped. The biggest oil guys in the world, the Middle East, you know, OPEC is spending a fortune in the shallow water Persian Gulf. Like this is happening. And so, yeah, oil can go to, I mean, oil can go negative. That, that, now, now, we, now, now we have that, that joke, but like, I, I, I just, on a two, three year basis, like, I, I just think if oil washes out, like you're just going to buy all this stuff because shale's gone and you know you know i look i 
obviously I have a position in Tidewater. I don't 100% disagree with you, but I just keep thinking, I remember back to 2016 where I'd hear, 2015, 2016, where I hear, hear people say, hey, we've got the global the global supply curve for oil mapped out, right? And oil can never go below 65 again because that's that's where the marginal barrel comes at. And, you know, 18 months later, oil's lingering at 40 or something. It's just gone through. And I just worry, like, it, again, Tidewater, it doesn't necessarily... There is a point, I think it's what I've heard from management teams. It's like the high fifties. If the forward curve kind of drops below the high fifties, that's where they think you could see a real decrease in, in the kind of uh, the cycle we're talking about here, though the supply story is not changing. So who knows? Because a lot of this is still profitable, but I, that's just one of the couple things I worry about here. Like when everybody seems so bullish, it seems like I remember I was talking to Nat gas guys in uh, the middle of last year, so middle of 2022, yeah. and that gas new spot was like nine, and they were saying, I keep looking at the demand curve, and I don't know how prices don't go up from here, right? I, there's no supply, and I don't know how we don't go up. Freeport goes offline 12 hours later, and that gas is, you know, today we're talking four. Yeah, I mean, you're talking all different, but I'm just throwing throwing thoughts. Yeah, so like, because you're, you're touching on a big discussion I have with a lot of people who go deep on this, which is, Asset quality, asset intensity, and, and duration, effectively. So let, let's break those pieces down. So that's why I describe offshore as like a snowball running yep. down the hill. It's so long cycle. And it's that's why it's driven by investment. These guys can't just stop. So on the margin, if we're increasing... And you have some type of a constructive view on the commodity and you think shale has really, you know, fired its best bullet, which at this point, you're not making a judgment call. They're telling you, I mean, you can see it in the production numbers. These guys had every reason to increase. And unless we find a new base and suddenly, which it just doesn't sound like there is one, you know, offshore becomes incredibly attractive. It's also the break evens because you think about the inventory the inventory of offshore is until we get rid of all the brownfield stuff that's just latching onto existing infrastructure. Like it's really good economics as part of a portfolio because it was just so minimized. We're coming off such a low base. And again, like versus a frack truck, or you know, I remember when sand was really big. This guy I worked with had the best like. Wisconsin white dramatic uh, thing. He was the, the, the guy's like incredibly successful. Uh, Co runs a massive fund, but um, I, I always got a kick out of him being like Wisconsin white. How's the Wisconsin white? And we do all these meetings with these guys, and this is back in oh god twelve thirteen. Guys would come in, march in, they'd be like, "We can do all of it at one times cash flow. We can build." And I'm like, "Don't tell me that, buddy." If you can do it, if you can like do a new sand mine in like four months and it's one times cash flow, we're going to have too many sand mines. Yep. Same thing with frack trucks and all the other stuff. You take offshore, like this is why I'm I'm so myopically focused on the new build, which is these are really expensive assets. Like an OSV now is I don't, I, I, 60 million bucks. And now we're going to play this tape back. And I, I keep saying 60, 70, 80, because I, I don't really no, I don't know. And all the boats have different specs and whatever. Tide, they, Tidewater slide. I'm looking at the Pareto deck uh, slide 21. They think it's 65. But as you said, who knows? Who knows what steel price is going to be who, when you start building? Knows? And things. like for yeah. offshore rigs, they say it's a billion. Like it's probably a billion too, might be a billion. Too. Like we just don't know. Like the point is time to build is way longer. It's at least two years. It's probably five. Well, the deep water rig is probably five, but like, you know, in OSB, it's probably two, two and a half, whatever. That's a long time to maintain. And like, it's just not going to get taken away. Where with gas, dude, they just, they drill another like, we have so much gas. Like the world is is a wash in gas. So I, I think the sustainability of the tightness is just way it's not comparable to other things. And that's what creates the convexity of the trade. Let me go through a few other things on the new build side. I'm sorry to keep focusing on new build. No, 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 it's, one, it's one of the things I love about this. Like, hey, yes, these guys are gonna mint money at 30,000 day rates, but this is OSVs, but they're going to make money at 30,000, but new build economics requires probably 40,000 or more plus sponsor guarantees. And everything. Let me just go through a, a couple more things. First, I think this is more applicable on the rig side than on the uh, OSB side. But, you know, for rigs, as you said, these are 20 or 25 year assets. 
a lot of people look at rigs and yes, we're going to have in the near to medium term, there's going to be a lot of drilling. I think there's going to be a lot of drilling in the long term. But if you're buying a 20 year asset, like, could you really look out to 2038, which is 15 years from now and say, for sure, we're going to be offshore drilling? Like, if not, like, you've really got to question kind of the out years of that, which pushes pricing up, pushes uh, kind of the cost of capital, all those assumptions up. So I, I think that's one other element of the new build story. Like, you, you kind of need to factor in even higher day rates in the short term to account for that questionable 15 plus year terminal value, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're touching another piece, though, as well, which is like interesting on the stock selection, which is the cat. There's a big counterpoint, which is that the oil companies got so burned with long term contracts that they're going to stay short and they'd rather take the risk on overpaying for a three year contract and locking in for 10. 10. Yep. And like, I think five might be the maximum duration that they're willing to do. And does that cap the multiples of the stocks? Now, the only offset to that is just to buy back a ton of <laughs> just to buy back a ton of shares. And do you really care? And it, certainly at this at, at where these stocks are valued right now, I just don't think you care because you know I, I have that this table I put in the report. I was like, all right, let's just do a five times multiple on four fifty a day for the deep water guys, and for Valeris, that's still up one hundred twenty percent from here. And but like, are you going to break through five times EBITDA for this business? You know, I I, I don't know. Um, and it may be, just be one where like you perpetually trade with a higher, you know, free cash flow yield or whatnot because people see that this is like this special moment. And I think that's something to consider. You know, I, I, I'm sort of the next chess move. I'm at, very at peace with that right now because, like I said. It, I slap a five times multiple on 450 a day and I'm like, I'm still penciling on a hundred percent return. And even if I don't get to eat that with Valeris for the next two and a half years, because of where they've contracted out, like well, this market's horrific. <laughs> like, and I'm saying the stock market, not the, uh, not the offshore market. Like you can like comfortably pencil out, pencil out with conservative returns, like a double in two and a half years. That's, you know, you know, a 20% IRR is a double in three and a half years. So like, it's pretty. <laughs> it, it reminds me. This is such a. But the terminal value questions and the also questions. It reminds me a little bit. It, we're obviously talking apples and oranges of tobacco, where they just always trade for this high free cash flow multiple, and everybody's worried next year it's going to go away. All this type of stuff, and they just print a bunch of free cash flow and they return it all to shareholders. And you know, you do great over a twenty year period. Obviously, twenty years, we'd have a whole new fleet for Tidewater if we're talking twenty years out. But I do think there's something to that. Let me, you know, go ahead, that's go ahead. not a bad thing either because you look Tidewater. The other thing that I really liked about it, going back through the history of what's happened and what I like about this management team, they've done everything that you would have wanted them to do. The GLF merger and, and these guys came from GLF was was unbelievable. They've taken corporate GNA per writ per boat from eight hundred thousand to four hundred thousand. Yep. Like they bought, you know, the GLF merger, then SPO, an unbelievable, you know, what I would say is a steal, but look at SPO. And this is the upside of what of the tobacco, ESG, whatever you want to call it. SPO own, you know, energy conglomerate. They just said we don't want to be in boats anymore. And we'll take a stupid price. <laughs> Um, because right it, 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 they took a, a it was a I mean Tidewater obviously got a great deal and it looks even better in hindsight because they they did it right before they had a thesis the market starting to turn we're starting to see it in rates and they did it and they had to do it with some warrants for a, a lot of bu- different reasons but they did it I SPO is probably happy those warrants they Tidewater stock went up well, those, I, I mean, mean those warrants are really just shares right because they're penny warrants those penny are yeah, yeah I, I'd say just, warrants just yeah yeah but I I think the SPO point I bet you if you talk to the SPO division guys um they probably went like, kicking and screaming they like boss like I know OSVs are a small part of S- SPO, but like, why are we getting rid of these things? The cycle is just about to turn and they got overruled. And so I think you're going to see, you know, more consolidation for non-economic reasons. Re- I don't know if it's not economic, but nonsensical reasons, you know, at valuations that are incredibly attractive. And I, you know, I, I don't think they get another deal like SPO, but I, I think you're going to get more of that. And I think, 
Oh, I think yeah. they're on both the off uh, on both the rigs and the vessel space. I do think there are smaller companies that have either a lot of leverage or they're basically owned by the banks. And I think if the banks can get out at par or something, they're going to be really pushing for, hey, every I, I, OSV company other than Tidewater has a debt issue. Yeah. Bur- is it Bourbon or Bourbon? I don't know what whatever the heck it's called, but like Bourbon, it, you know, it, it, you know, it, it, is in the news there's the norwegian uh, there's a bunch of norwegian ones that fredrickson's all over um which was that's uh, farstad solastad um which i forget what the, the name is now but like of the top few there's a bunch of these things and they all have, uh, have debt issues so i wouldn't be the worst thing of course you don't need m&a like yep. at, at all and i mean i think it's good but I, I think if the simplest thing with why why this is going to work, other than all the reasons that we've talked about, which is you know the supply and demand is really in your favor, you're seeing increased investment, it, the, a sector that just was utterly leveled, completely just left for dead with second and third order impacts of like people long long tenure employees leaving. I mean that's the other thing with new build. I don't know where we get the people to staff these boats. <laughs> Or, or rigs. To build the boats and staff the boats. And, and, uh, and yeah. staff them, which all else equal is going to lead to, you know, massive day rate inflation. So, but um, I think it's just as simple as we're pr- probably going to get at least to new build economics. And we're going to get there probably in the next two years. And once we get there, we're probably going to go well through that. And we're going to sustain rates well above that. And if we just get to new build economics and you put an unheroic multiple, you're penciling out, you know, easy doubles across this space. And, you know, knowing in the back of your mind that, like, we probably can do a lot better than that. So let me ask about valuation here, right? Because you've mentioned doubles, Valeris over 100. It is difficult because you're talking in cyclical industry, right? And I, I think anyone listening knows both of us think, it, I, just to focus on Tidewater, and I walk through this with the Tidewater management. Tidewater manager says, hey, $18,500 day rates. We do $666 million in EBITDA. That's probably about $600 million in free cash flow. Maybe take a little bit off there, whatever. But this is a $1.8 billion company that I think there's line of sight to $600 million in free cash flow or more, given all the supply demand. Like I do think we're going to get past the 18500 average rates, just given that supply demand. But you know, it, it is hard for value investors to look at this. This is a cyclical business, as we've talked about. Six hundred million in free cash flow, eighteen and a half thousand day rates. I still think that's well below new build economics. But you know, they were doing uh, pro forma. They did eighty five million in EBITDA in two thousand twenty one pro forma for the deals. Everything. So we're talking this massive, massive growth. Uh, we're talking a lot of free cash flow on this peak number. I think it could go even better. But how do you think about just? valuing these things on a normalized mid-cycle after like how do you think about valuing these stocks just pick your rate pick the time you're going to get it and discount back but you know 18 and a half thousand day rate i think we can go there i think we go to, how do you think about five years out picking a rate picking a terminal value all that type of stuff Dude, you can't go five years out like okay. if- <laughs> well you know any value investor i understand there's this huge cash flow. What I love about these things, I think we're going to get all of the market cap, all the EV back in the next three ish years, three to four years or something. But, you know, any value investor, their typical thing is you go look at a company, you figure out what the mid cycle earnings are, and you slap multiple on it. And the tough thing for me looking at a tidewater of Laris, any of these guys is saying, okay, we've got all these dynamics. We got what is the mid cycle earnings number that I'm slapping a multiple on? You can't do that with this. And, and the, the, we are we are in the stage where energy, where I'm putting out <laughs> a memo on Tidewater and people are like, I remember that name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. And you know, Transocean maybe go bankrupt. And, and that's why I'm like, stupid math, put it on the sheet, stupid multiple. Are you penciling out a double? Yes. Okay. Is that reasonably going to happen in two years? Yes. All right. What are your bookends? Because this is energy. All right. I, I, I just have horror false precision in this space because you just can't do it. Because these things are going to trade. At the end of the day, every rig and o- every OSB is going to be scrapped. They're all worth zero. Yep. yep. Okay. And at different points in time, 
you're going to pay a massive premium to the theoretical nav, which is based on that mid-cycle over the remaining useful life of the asset. This is the only time in my career where I can argue with some reasonable certainty that we're probably going to have a market perception of an extension of useful life over the termency of the trade, which is like an unbelievable bonus. That's like their average fleet age is 10 years. Actually, most most offshore things have about a 10-year average fleet life. And my contention is we're, it's not going to be a 30 years. It's going to be the, because of where we are with new build, all these assets are going to last another 30 years from today. I don't need that. But like, okay, rates going up. What's a fair multiple? Five times is a fair multiple uh, based on historics and also based on the, I, I walked through in the memo, the unit the unit economics that sort of gets you to that. I, and again, I'm arguing, if you really have the 30 years, not 20, you're worth seven times, not not five, but be that as it may. And we're saying 450 a day. And we're saying, you know, you're quoting the Tidewater slide that's like the fleet average yeah, prior yeah, yeah, peak yeah. was 18,000 a day. You really have to adjust that for fleet composition because they used to have a ton of towing supply. The deep water, you know, PSV greater than 900 uh, square meter uh, deck and the deck size is really important. Size is important. Oh, God. You can just like go nuts with offshore. But like, um, you know, those things were getting just under 30,000 a day. And that's what really what we're saying, which is like my mid case is like you get 30,000 a day in the deep water and just whatever. And that's like 700 and change um, of EBITDA and then 40,000 you get, um, you know, the billion. So I'm just like, I, I, I don't know. My bookends are we're cheap here. Yep. And I, I think the, you know, where you're going to run in, assuming oil prices stay somewhat stable you know, in a range, I think you're going to run into this, like, you know, it's most pertinent with Valeris, but it's pertinent with every other thing where it's like the near term multiple is, you know, 12, 13 times. That's too much to pay, even at some discount rate. What are we going to discount, you know, the fair, the future rates back at, I don't know, 20, 20%. I don't know. These things are all unlevered, but people hate, hate, energy and people don't trust it so you need wide lanes and that's really what i'm saying which is you can get very it's not hard to pencil out doubles and so for right here i think you should own a lot of it um, would, would my just real silly math uh, tidewater just to give one example because that's the one we're focusing on everything but we we i can do the silly math with blair too Tidewater, I again, I'm I'm with you. The eighteen and a half thousand day rates probably too simple, but they've got six hundred sixty six million in EBIT on it. Let's just call it six fifty to make that math even. If I say six fifty, I slap a five times multiple on it. That gets me to a three point two billion EV divided by fifty two million shares outstanding because net depth is basically flat after Q four. That would get me to a sixty dollars share price. So we're we're low thirties right there. We're low sixties there. You've basically got your double. I mean, obviously there's a lot, but you're kind of talking, hey, th- that's kind of the math you're looking at. And, uh, you know, five times EBITDA is about 6x free cash flow in this thing. You've probably got four years of massive free cash flow. So you're getting most of that $60 per share target-ish price I talked about. You're getting 40-ish back in the next five years called. Is that, I threw out a lot of numbers, but is that kind of making a- Yeah, I give no sense? credit really for cash flow. So I'm just saying on a static multiple basis, yeah. but yes, agreed. You're going to get all the cash flow. And so like, there's the number I'll say, you know, in the memo, I think I put 80 bucks. You walk through the $60 case. I'm using a higher mid, but it doesn't matter. Like, Plus all the free cash flow. Plus, like, let's not forget every time an energy thing gets starts working, it gets way overdone by the market. And now the offset is these things are really hard to get to get the last dollar and you shouldn't expect to get the last dollar. But I, I think from a risk reward. So like, what am I saying? This is super convex, meaning, you know. Not a lot of downside. And if it goes down, you're going to like lean into this. You're probably, your downside is probably time, which is you're just deferring and delaying the inevitable, right? So. You know, if this thing goes to 20, you size it up a bunch. In like mid 40s, you're going to peel back a little bit. Mid 50s, you're going to pull back a little bit. And then you're going to pick your number that you want it to run. And then at some point, people are going to price these things on like, I don't know, PE or something that you're never supposed to do. And you're going to have a bunch of tourists talking about book value multiple. I don't know. It's always something. But like, you know, it will become 
symmetric risk as, as opposed to, you know, convex. And then I guess the, not for much, not to go too trader on people or something, but, you know, I think a lot of people are going to look at, I, I just pulled up the Tidewater chart and they're going to say, oh, this was 20 in late September. This was low teens at the beginning of 2022. Like I've missed this. This, this is up a lot. And look, everybody would have loved to buy in the low teens and running into the low thirties. But to me, like the interesting thing about it today is now we have proof of concept, right? Again, the yeah. leading rates, it, it's no longer betting on the leading rates. We're seeing the leading rates. You, uh, you the rates track- and the utilization. And that's the big thing. Like Tidewater now breaks out by uh, vessel size. So PSV over 900 square meters Yep, and, and, and below. You can literally, people who understand this industry, like the big boats, the, the tier one assets are already at 85% utilization. Yep. And the tier two and there's assets. No, there's no, like people talk about the utilization of the overall fleet. The things that aren't getting used right now as you said, the big assets are already approaching max utilization. The things that aren't getting used, the things that are uh, cold stacked or whatever, those are the really small boats, which will come online, but they're not going to move the needle like a 900 meter plus. Right. And so most of Tidewater's fleet is 750 and bigger. And like they've got a lot of boats actually that are like the 750 to 900. And those things are only 70% utilized. They're not getting, I think they're getting like 12,000. There's a big gap in what they're, what they're getting. That's going to catch you up to the to the other one and you're gonna have this ratchet where those come up and then the the, the best assets go up and then people have to decide what they want to do so it, it's you know back in rig speak this is easier for me to explain conceptually because with psvs it's like yep, yep, size. Yep, yep. with rig people see all this math and they they get all excited about oh twelve thousand foot depth eight thousand foot depth oh my god the average deep water rig, I think, drills at 4,000 or 5,000 meters. So it's not that the tier four assets don't work for most wells. It's that most guys want, they're like, well, if I am if I can get the Ferrari, I want the Ferrari. I don't really need it. Like a Ford Taurus really gets it done for most of these things. Um, and so what you're going to see now is effectively, you know, not the Ford Tauruses, but I'll say, you know, the BMWs are start going to start really getting priced. Yep. I think the other thing too that's a little bit lost with Tidewater that's like super exciting to me, and this also impacts Transocean more than other things. The drill ship has been the biggest evolution technologically in offshore in the last uh, probably fifty years. And it used to be if you were going off deep water, you were you had a semi submersible, which is just like you know, steel poles, and it needs to be kept in place by multiple OSVs. You don't have any deck space. So you got, you know, PSVs and you got anchor handling stuff and whatnot. The drill ship is basically a merge of a semi with like three different uh, PSVs into one asset. So it can dynamically position. It doesn't need anchor handling. You got more deck space and whatnot, right? What we are through drill ship utilization effect, like we're you know, I don't know, 90% of drill ships are not contracted, and the semis are the latent asset effectively in offshore. And so, like, Transocean has a ton of semis that are getting you know 275, 300 a day. Once we're done with drill ships, there's nothing that's going to stop a semi from getting 450, 500 a day. What also means for OSVs is. We are where we are on utilization with max drill ship utilization. So it used to be that you needed four OSVs for every yep. one deep water asset. With a drill ship, it's not four to one. I, I, I don't know what the it, part of the number is like how far out you are because think about like a platform, a PSV is a platform supply vessel. They have to like orbit. It's like, okay, you need one to show up every couple of days. So if you're doing pre salt in Brazil, you need <laughs> a lot more. If you're shallow water in the Persian Gulf, you don't need a ton. We are going to like, but with the semi-submersibles, you need more PSVs. We're at full utilization of the best PSVs in uh, ATHS. Oh, God, I always screw that one up. ATHS is the anchor, anchor towing and handling, whatever. We're basically at full utilization. And then the incremental is going to need more OSVs, which is going to just be this massive up move in rate for both. And I think it's going to be up rate. On the on the drill ship side as well. So 
I think and, that's one dynamic. It's a nerdy point, but like I think it's a no, really big deal. And this is this is basically saying the other side in a simplified and dumbed down way. But you know, we're there on the milk runs and the brownfield expansions. You know, if you start getting the big greenfield expansion stuff, which I do think are coming based on, you know, I think Petro Bros has a couple. Like as you said, we're max utilization, and we haven't really hit like people are going wild drilling offshore, and we're we're already basically at max utilization. Like things could. Things get pretty crazy from here. Offshore, we are at 2010 levels of offshore CapEx. From 2010 to 2014, offshore global CapEx doubled. Like, we're nowhere. Uh, Let's see. We have covered so much. We've bounced around like crazy uh, through a lot of stuff. But I I just want to ask before we finish up, you know, we've covered a lot. But anything you think people, anything you're getting asked questions about or people are talking to you that you think we should hit on the podcast before we kind of wrap it up? No, that's kind of, I mean, there's always something, everybody takes like a a different angle and, you know, I I think this is a lot, people forgot the asset quality and, you know, what I call the snowball thing of that objects in motion tend to stay in motion offshore and they're just so used to shale and these frack truck companies that, by the way, these frack truck companies, you know, it's basically you're paying a frack truck multiple for an offshore asset. That's a, it's another, you know, super simplified way to think about it. Um, that's like a big one people get at. And, you know, you touched on the ESG stuff, like what are we going to do with oil? I, I think a lot of these questions actually become very fair if the sector rallies 50 to 75 percent. But like, great, the sector rallied 50 to 75 percent. <laughs> great. <laughs> I'll have all these debates. <laughs> yeah. We'll have uh, all these debates while we're paying uh, our capital well, gains taxes and heading to the beach to, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I think the other, we didn't really talk about OPEC um, and, and Ukraine. And I think the Ukraine thing is really interesting just because it's leading to energy nationalism. And I, that is all, like, Everything geopolitically that's happening, the reemergence of of OPEC, which what that does is it tells you that there's a price floor, there's a put. And that for offshore, when you're talking about multi-year CapEx cycles, the OPEC put being there, we haven't even touched the SPR thing because I I don't really need to. Like, all I need to know for offshore is like OPEC is there. It has your back. That's something that it's like the inverse of the Fed. We've lost the Fed put. We've got the OPEC put. Um, no, I, I, hear, th- I hear you, but the reason I didn't touch on it is a, cause I'm not as comfortable with it, but B, I, I don't even think you need it at this point, right? Yeah. Like you've already got the rates there. You've already got, like, you don't even need it because again, it, it does help because the, the downside here is oil goes to 40 for a long time or something. And yeah. if you've got the put, you can you sort of touch on it too, to yeah. the last piece, which is these stocks have run a ton and like people have a little bit of shard issues. And to that, I'm just like, dude. It's unbelievable how beat up these things were. And they were they were rightly beat up because it was written off. And I, 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 I agree with your point. I think it's a much easier trade now because you have proof of concept. When I first started talking to a lot of people at Sidewater and the offshore in general, all of them would go RSI. What is that? Relative strength index. They'd be like, you can't. These are up 50 percent in uh, in three months. The RSA is off the chart. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, day rates went from 12 that leading day rates went from 12,000 to 17,000 in those three months. And every day, dollar a day rate falls basically straight through to the bottom line. Like it yeah. seems like a, it seems like you've hit the inflection point. And yeah, you're paying up more than you were three or four months ago, but we've seen the inflection point. Like I'm paying for a little more certainty. Cool. Uh, anyway, why don't we wrap it up there, guys? Again, I, I mean, should, the the write up was so good. I'm going to include a link to the write up to the spaces in the show notes. I've got the link to the write up in the spaces, so everybody will have Judd's contact info to uh, to hit him up with any questions here, or you know, if you're a bigger fund than me, to talk about the all, all the other services you offer. But Judd, this has been so great. Thank you so much for coming on, and thanks for having me on again. Awesome. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.